Hello and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Gail McAuliffe, the Senior Advisor Data Management at the Canadian Air Transportation Security Authority. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today we are joined by Gail McAuliffe, the Senior Advisor Data Management at the Canadian Air Transportation Transportation Security Authority, and she is a member and former board member of the Dama National Capital Region. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. So, Gail, hello Hi. and welcome. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. Great to see you. Great to be with you. Thank Likewise. You. Likewise, likewise. We've known each other for a while, um, and thanks for all your contributions to the data management community. You were so active in, in so many things that we do and really been a great network and support to so many um, so many others I know. So um, really appreciate it, Gail. So tell me, what is your, you know, I just kind of blurred over it, but what's your current job title? And so what does that mean? What is it you do? Okay, so I'm a senior advisor. Uh -huh. at CATSA, which I explained to people, it's the Canadian equivalent of the TSA. It, the, the only difference is that the screeners that you see in the airports in Canada actually work for a screening contractor who's, who's, been, um, who's been contracted by CATSA to provide those screening officers. And uh, that's the only difference. The protocols are very similar. We work closely with the TSA as well as other um, agencies in Europe and uh, the Far East. So at the moment, I am I'm here to help push, continue to drive forward the data management program. It was implemented in 2014, and it took a while for it to get some momentum. And I've been trying to push the importance of data, important of including data management at the table as early as, earlier as in the process as possible. Because I remember when I first started, uh, one of our big, uh, our most important identifier of data is locations. And then for, you know, how, the airport, what terminal it's in, where is the equipment located? Is it, and the screening lines for passengers, is it a special line for, that is wider for people with families or with special needs who, you know, like a wheelchair, they need wider access. Is it something um, for trusted travelers? That's the industry term for if you have TSA pre-check or um, global entry or the Nexus Pass, many of your viewers will be uh, quite uh, as, as people who travel for business, well, often those people should have those. It makes things much faster. And what would happen is an airport would decide that, oh, that line's, um, we are, we're gonna be doing some renovations, so you need to close that line down. And we'd find out after the fact, and, or they'd, someone would open a new location at, a, at an airport, and we, we'd find out when someone would contact the business team responsible for the reporting and say, why are my reports long, wrong? I don't see this screening line in my report or this screening line used to be family special needs and now it's just a regular line. Why is it still showing as FSN? And that's one of the things that we in data always know. The most important thing when you start a new, at a new place is learn those acronyms and those common business terms. I also chair the data stewardship team. So I work with them to help with the training and I work with other people in IT. And because we are a government agency, data, we don't quite follow the DEMA wheel. So for um, security classification, that belongs to our corporate security department. And then we have an information management team and they're responsible for privacy. So 
it's a lot of collaboration to make sure that we're looking after the data properly properly and one of the other things that i've been doing is writing um, the data management policy as well as the cloud solutions policy and the data management framework for you know formal documents so uh, that's been interesting and and fun and it's fascinating it's it always is fascinating to me you know the data that people look at and that they deal with and um you know that it's truly interesting and and in interesting times um so Tell me, you know, Gail, in, when you were a little girl, did you dream of being a senior advisor of data management when you grew up? Like, is that what you wanted to be? <laughs> no, I don't. I didn't even know it existed. Actually, my parents used to, my parents are both from the UK and they used to tease me that I was like a shop steward because I had a righteous sense of injustice. So I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll be a good lawyer one day. And then oh, yeah. um, I realized, no. I, because I did, and we loved debate in our family, and uh, you know, and I'm, I was always obsessed with fairness. So, oh, that would be interesting. Then I started um, once I was in undergrad and met actual law students. I realized, no, that isn't really for me. So I just got a liberal arts education, which um, often people do. And as Paula Poundstone says, the reason adults ask kids what do you want to be when you grow up? Because the adults are looking for ideas. And that was one thing. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something interesting and hopefully make a positive contribution. So I started uh, off yeah. Yeah, I started off as a, an underwriter for a property casualty insurance company, so houses and cars. And without knowing it, it was actually good training for data management because preciseness and accuracy are so important in mm -hmm. insurance. You know, describe, uh, you know, describe the piece of jewelry that you're, that you're putting additional insurance on. And if it's a diamond, you know, it's uh, the clarity, the cut, the color, um, and obviously, and the size all determine the value. So those are dimensions of a diamond, but I didn't know what dimensions were back then. Um, also, slowly changing dimensions. Dates are so important in insurance. For example, um, I have, you know, I have a break-in at my house, and I things are stolen. But mm -hmm. I just submitted my application to the insurance broker. But the insurance broker has often been given the granted the authority to act to bind coverage, so actually cover you as, as soon as you signed your application. So that application might not even be at the insurance. Well, back last century, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have arrived by courier or snail right. mail to <laughs> the insurance company. But yes, you're still covered because you know you have the effective date was the first of March. And the uh, the break-in happened on the second of March, and the underwriter didn't see it until the third of March, but that's okay because the underwriter would have agreed to, to write it. So that's um, that's something that really stood me in. and also document your file. My very first manager, that was her mantra, which meant mm. record the date and the time, the name of the person, what agency or insurance brokerage they were from, and then the details. And I've actually had my notes looked at twice in examinations for discovery, pre-trial examination so mm -hmm. um again that's all about the data so so how did that lead you to your current role and what um what was your path to get into become a data management expert it was it was quite circuitous i'd say i um you know was underwriter at, at different companies and i then began to work at a new company as a as an a head office underwriter, which is someone who advises underwriters across the um, across the different regions of the country as to what you know how to define a coverage. I also helped to write policy wording or update policy wordings. But that was back when most insurance policy wordings were written in legalese, and we were changing it to uh, plain language. And that position was in the technical team, which. Right. So beside a small IT shop and 
I worked closely with a business analyst, thought, oh, that looks interesting. So next job I got was as a business analyst, um, working for a, a startup in, uh, in insurance. And I started off as a, a BA and then I became um, a product owner and project manager. We wore lots of hats in the back then. And I discovered SQL and it was like, oh, now the system <laughs> makes so much sense to me. I can right click and expand the tables. I can do select top 10, 100 to see what those values are. And I realized that was what was really interesting to me. So my first real data management job was implementing, uh, represent, representing the project management business side of the organization in, in conjunction with an MDM implementation consulting firm. And it, for a large pharmaceutical, global pharmaceutical uh, operation and the first uh, data management or the first subject matter for their master data management, uh, contacts, which is people. So, you know, didn't define party. We just went right into contacts and it, it really helped un uncover for me or open my eyes to all the, all the potential issues, because especially when you have sales reps who are commission um, driven, their compensation information is often how many sales they make. So you can't display their sales information to another sales rep. And it was, it, to the point that they enforced, you can't, you can't see another sales rep's contacts or customers, which makes sense, except when you have two sales reps in the same geographical region, but selling different product types. Mm -hmm. So there were so many duplicates because of course, the first thing that they would do is search to see if that doctor's office already existed and they wouldn't see it because it existed for someone else. So yeah. yes, it, it was interesting. And, uh, and that, that was fun. And um, then I just continued in different data roles um, in insurance and in healthcare. And I eventually became um, global director of business intelligence for a uh, global global insurance broker. And it was interesting because we did operational financial reporting from our data warehouse. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a lot. It was very interesting at uh, the, the last week or two of the month in the first week of the month, because that's when everyone wanted to look at their reports. And of course, sure. when you're trying to load transactions that uh, during, you know, for two weeks in the month, hardly anyone looks at. And then for the first and the last week, everyone, everyone's loading transactions and everyone's trying to look at it. So um, then we made the decision to move back to Canada. And so I ended up in Ottawa and, uh, you know, as a, almost bilingual person. I wanted the opportunity to be able to uh, re regain my uh, French speaking and, and writing. So that's been fun. Oh, nice. And, yeah. So here, and so here I am and continuing to do it. And luckily, lucky enough to be able to work from home whilst I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing this. Fascinating. It's, it's a very interesting path indeed. Um, and so as you've grown into this, you know, we've talked, uh, um, do you see the importance of, um, so, well, actually, let me back up a bit. What, what is mm -hmm. your definition of data then? And how, um, how do you work with it? You've talked about it a little bit, but how do you work with it um, in your current job? You talked about the data that you analyze, but what else do you do with it? So it, I mean, there are so many different definitions of data from, you know, the, the, the numbers and letters that are entered into a system. But to me, it's data is a raw material um, gleaned from an organization's 
information and you know the system source from your your systems and processes and it becomes information and knowledge when it's put in the proper context so i think that my favorite part of the job is data in context and promoting a common understanding um, for instance i once worked for a a um, multi-hospital chain and what define a patient and is it a patient you know people it, it was a specialty hospital so people would come to be diagnosed so mm -hmm. um it someone decided that you don't call a person a patient until they've had their first treatment oh. well some treatments can also be considered diagnostic uh, procedures. So when is it a diagnostic procedure and when is it an actual treatment? That was a bone of contention. And some of the business, the, the people whose compensation relied on revenue would say, um, well, a new patient is any of these procedures well, okay, so you're going to artificially inflate your, you know, your number of new patients in, in the first year using this because it was an organization that decided to implement a new process by implementing a new system. And so fine for the first year, you'd look great, but in the second year, it would drop because you're not, you're not always converting those it's like not people who come for a second opinion and that's the only reason they come versus the people who come for for a clear diagnosis maybe it is second opinion and decide hey this is where i want to have my treatment so that that was interesting and uh, you know what is a, a hospital bed you know or what no say what is an inpatient well an inpatient is someone who's in a bed well if they're being treated in the emergency room is that a bed or not? Oh. Um, that was lots of fun. Sorry, I got off track for a moment there, but. Oh, no, I love it. I mean, you said that, you know, data in context is your favorite thing and that's some really good examples. You know, it sounds yeah. so easy to just say to, you know, what is a patient and, and you know, it seems like it's such a simple thing, but it's not, it's, it's, very, it's very complicated. Um, Especially in the data diversity webinars when people say, oh, you know, Customer is something that, you, you know, is a subject area of master data. And the people who have been in data management for a while kind of chuckle to themselves saying, yeah, it's an obvious place to start, but it's not an easy place to start because, right. you know, define a customer. Well, to a marketing person, a customer is a someone who has a potential to buy something, someone you want to attract to your web website perhaps or to your store well to to uh, in to a, a brick and mortar store or to the um, you know the accounts payable people it's someone who's actually per made a purchase is a customer everyone else is a potential customer or a or just a contact and actually at that hospital some of the inside sales reps because they were you know if if they answered a call from a potential patient, then they, they, that person would always be rooted back to them. So they would get, that person did become a patient, then that kind of, you know, that was a positive uh, aspect of their compensation. And they want it, but it takes time to enter information into the system when you're talking to someone. So they wanted to be able to save a contact with just the first name yeah how many you know not you know there aren't as many shannons and gales in the world as there are johns and peters and sure. marys <laughs> and karens so right, right. that it's just not feasible with a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year the dataversity training center is your launch pad for career success Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase.
and, and is that how you work with data currently in your current role is putting it into context for people and and uh, is that primarily what how, what you do and that yeah yeah. One of the one of the first things I did was for myself, I created a glossary because there was a glossary of terms for, you know, specific to, you know, what's a screening officer, what's a um, a passenger. Those are pretty straightforward. But um, there were all there was a lot of specialty things, but I just wanted to make sure that we're even though we're using the same word, is it do are we do we mean the same thing? Right. Like customer is a great example. We're we're using the same word, but there are three different definitions depending on the area of the business. So, mm -hmm. you know, you how many uh, how many vendors advertise that they can give you a three hundred and sixty degree view of your customer? Well, that's great if you know who that what that if everyone agrees that customer means the same thing. And so yeah. that's yeah. one of my, the biggest things that I try and, and, and emphasize to people is define your process, define your terms before you try and implement a tool. Um, I remember listening to Claudia Imhoff when, one time, and she was talking about uh, the, um, the first class airline experience where the CEO talks to another CEO and learns about this great tool that they've just implemented and it's increased revenue and decreased costs. And they come to IT and say, okay, we wanna implement this. What for, why? And <laughs> they don't know, they just heard that it's a good thing. So, you know, just like data-driven approach a couple of years ago, everybody wanted the data-driven approach, but no one was really sure what that meant. Now we're talking about data literacy. People don't understand the data, but you don't want to say, oh, you're data illiterate, because that sounds insulting. And um, everyone knows data is important, but it, it's working with them to understand why it's important. Um, working with the people who are actually entering the data to show them the downstream effect of their data. One place I worked, the um, place of birth was a, was a field, you know, we had an out of out of the box uh, billing system for, mm -hmm. for patients. And unfortunately there were some people who were homeless and they used the place of birth field to indicate that someone was homeless, but no one never ever told data or the, or the business areas that consumed that data. So they look and they see, oh, look, there's a place of birth. That would be great for clinical research, because if you have many people with the same, say, a same type of cancer, all born in the same place, that's, that's a critical data element for research, but not if it's used for something totally different. Right. Yeah. And, and the same was as um, out of the box uh, systems that give you user defined fields, but you can't change the name of the field from, you know, in the database from UDF one through 100. Um, so then you have to, that's why you, then you need to map out what is that used for. In one place um, I worked, it was, it was they, they heavily um, customized the out of the box solution. And when someone say, oh, we want to be able to track this. Okay, well, we'll just add it. We've got a, a, a clear UDF over here, we'll add it. And then someone would ask for something, sim someone similar. But, and that's another thing that I try and do is, let's not build a report or a dashboard before first checking if there's already something we have that works. Because um, unfortunately, Ever since I've been in data, we've had that problem with, with silos of data and people come to the, re, you know, the report developers wherever they sit in the organization and say, well, we want this. And so then the report is built and because it's the easiest way to do security, okay, everyone who belongs to this business unit or this business area can view, view the, the report of the dashboard, but no one else can. And then you have someone 
who who wants exact a very similar report and they don't know that something already exists that might just need a few tweaks to work for them or could already work for them. So that's something that I also try to do is um, one place I worked, we were converting uh, or migrating from one pl um, reporting platform to another. And we were able to reduce, I think we started off with like 420 reports and we had it down to 130 or, or so because there were so many duplicates, so many things that you could, that uh, were just, oh, look, I like this report, but can you add in a column? So instead of adding a column to the, the existing report, a new report was created. And then again, if you don't have a good catalog of what your data solutions are, you you could be creating the same thing over and over again. So that um, so I guess I'm more on the business side, trying to to teach them how to work with their data and what what to look for and how to how to increase the quality of their data. I love it. That is that is it's that's hard work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very impressive. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Gail, um, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years or so and why? I think I think it's going to increase because everyone's caught the data bug, so to speak. And but we can't take advantage of that data without um, without people who can help the business. Um, fine tune their data, you know, data quality is the very first thing that you need to do. It sounds boring. Um, you, but you, and you also need, we need, everyone needs, you need to have a business glossary. You need to have a data dictionary that ties to the business glossary. You need to have good, good data models. I know a lot of people, especially in an agile world think, well, Data, mar data architecture is just a waste of time. It takes too long. Well, no, if you don't have a map, then how are you going to get to where you want to be? And to me, a, a good, an enterprise data model is a map of the existing business. And then as you, as you bring in new data sources, bring in new data solutions, you, you have to keep your like as a business analyst, you always want to keep your requirements updated. As someone who's working data, you always want to have your data model current. And you need that common understanding across the organization. Um, the, and it's, you know, and there's always new technology coming out. And you, in order to take advantage of it, you need people who can understand that, that technology. You know, um, many people are realizing that they don't many organizations are realizing you don't need to keep everything on premises. And you know, vendors are kind of pushing that by saying, you want the, the best that we have to offer? Well, it's available in the cloud. Okay. And you know, so that you have to be prepared to use the cloud in there. Sometimes when you've got, you have to have a hybrid model because there's just some data that you, that uh, maybe for regulatory reasons you can't have in the cloud. Makes sense. So what advice then would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? I think the first thing is don't be afraid to ask questions. So you can learn a lot. There is, and there's so much tacit knowledge, undocumented knowledge. Um, I remember on, on one of the recent webinars, someone was talking in the, in the chat about interviewing someone who was about to retire from the agency after 30 years or more. And, and he's building kind of like a, an encyclopedia of knowledge based on that person's historical knowledge and all that tacit knowledge, all the knowledge that's up in your head. You need, you need to learn from that. Um, technical skills are important. You need to be able to work well with whatever the technology 
is, is that's available, but a lot of it, you can learn it easily too, but just make sure you keep those technical skills, skills up. When you start working at an organization, find the glossary. If there isn't one, just start one in an Excel spreadsheet for yourself. You can maybe even put it in a SharePoint list until the organization's ready to invest in a tool like a data dictionary and, and, a, and data lineage is so important as well. You need to understand the organization's processes and um, don't ask for, okay, well, don't ask for the manual and how the, the user's guide for a system because that's what everyone expects people to do. But just like that example of the, the date of birth that was common understanding within a small team of people, or sorry, place of birth being used um, yeah. for a totally different reason, you need to see, you know, if you can, as a, I remember sitting beside someone and when I first started out as an organization, just asking, well, can you just show me what you do? And um, as a business analyst trying to, to help define the requirements for a new application, and people are so thinking in, well, this is the way I've always done it, but that's just because the system requires you to do these steps. What is, so I, you know, I would say, imagine you've got a physical piece of paper that you, what do you have to do to the information on that piece of paper to be able to move it to the next step? And don't think about, about well, how you currently do that. Think about what needs to be done and then, then we can figure out how best a, a tool can, can facilitate that process. And so often we, we migrate to a new platform, but we migrate our garbage, our redundant report, our rot data, as Peter Aiken likes to call it, redundant, obsolete, and trivial. That's, um, that's important. Um, you know, keep learning, but you need business knowledge as well. You, you, can, you can't get a, a deep down business knowledge, but you need enough business knowledge. You, and so not only don't be afraid to ask questions, but know who to ask or where to go to find the answers. Because that's one of the things I, I've always said to people is, I may not know the answer, but I will find, I will find the answer. And the more you do it, the more you know where to, where to look for those right answers for that information. Um, and don't forget your business subject matter experts. Don't forget what uh, people sometimes refer to as the shadow IT, the, um, the departments who have built their own data analytics solutions. You know, what are they doing? Let's learn from them. But maybe we can leverage what's already there. Maybe we can teach them how to leverage what they've already built and, and help make it better. So I think, yeah, I think that's about it. I and also, yeah, go ahead. Join DEMA, join the data, the data yeah. governance professionals organization, um, attend their diversity webinars, you know, look at the, professional training available, go to the con go to conferences. That's one of the things that I learned. Yes, there's a lot of, of great speakers and presentations where you learn a lot, but you also learn so much just having a cup of tea or coffee with someone, um, with a colleague, or, you know, having a drink after in the evening. And you you talk, data people like to talk about data problems and data solutions, and that's been very helpful as well. And I think that's one of the reasons that I really enjoy data diversity webinar, webinars is because I'm with my people. <laughs> I'm with people who understand the value of data and are yeah. are fighting to bring that that their understanding to the organizations they work with. That's awesome. So I think, you know, in summary there, I mean, it's so important is, you know, really to have an open mind, be curious and yes. be open to learning and don't assume anything, right? Ask oh, that is the best, best thing. Don't assume and um, don't presume either. Yeah. Um, and especially, you know, I know that when you're starting off, you're full of 
confidence in your technical abilities, but you know, listen as I, it's amazing. I read um, Peter Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People so many years ago, and so many things he says come come back to me as you first seek to understand. So don't try. And I know we are, I I'm guilty of this too, where you want to jump in and help. But you can't help if you don't understand the problem. So first seek to understand the problem from the point of view of the different business areas. And you know, and that's why you need a map of data modeling. You can't get to where you're going if you don't know where you are right now. So true and so important. And Gil. Thank you so much. This has been really a great conversation and really interesting in what you're doing. Um, I, I love these conversations to find out more about about you and what you're and all the things, the great things that you're doing. Um, and, and thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you like to keep up to date on the latest podcasts and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, Gail, thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. This has been so much fun. I love talking data. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.